Gerard Atencio and uh, Ray Rock.
And that was at the lake side, Lake Wood, the New Jersey side. So they talked about the new inversion of uh, the Teledyne analyzers. We have not purchased any of those. We have demonstrated to us. Uh, they're going along some of the same lines that uh, the thermal analyzers did. Uh, their concern, I guess, is that analyzers have a tendency to use too much electricity or too much. Their energy policies, is what their description was. So going to a uh, high power DC power supply running all the years and, and uh, along those lines, that's what Thermo did with their IQ series and Teledyne is going to follow that same pattern. Hopefully they will have the, they will have their uh, firmware more uh, up to date before the, it really gets on the on so I know Ray was doing a lot of talking. Uh, this, I've only been with Cisco for a year, uh, had no prior experience with commissions or anything like that. Um, David's been trying to hire me for quite a while. I was on the active duty Air Force, so obviously he would take the job. Uh, but I went to reserves, and, and here I am. Um, I've been working with Ray since September of last year, and this man has got a wealth of knowledge. Uh, I am better with the newer analyzers, the thermos and the tappies. Uh, I call him the wizard when it comes to like road months. It's, you know, it's figured out. Um, but when you guys order a, a SEMS system and you got brand new analyzers in it, or you order spares or replacement analyzers, if it's the, the new tapping of thermals, I'm the one that's in that. Um, I go in, I, I put in all your ranges, and you know, it's voltage to current, I update the firmware, and to kind of piggyback on the firmware issue with the thermals, we had a bash of thermal IQ analyzers that when the power was cycled on, it dropped all user settings. And so it convert from parts per million back to parts per billion. And so that's the, the upgrade, firmware upgrade that thermal released afterwards to address that issue. But with releasing that firmware upgrade, they actually introduced another issue where if you try to do too many things at one time on the analyzer, it would freeze up and reboot itself. Like an angry Windows computer. So, um, Ray and I work closely with the thermal tech support and the tapping tech support. We got you know, tapping reps that we talk with on a regular basis because we're kind of their R and D department. Um, we tell them what, what we want, and you know sometimes they deliver, sometimes they don't. And like he was saying, with these new N series analyzers uh, from Tappy. They run the new review software, so the interface itself is pretty much the same. They have changed a little bit within it to make it more friendly for the end user. Uh, but as like an analyzer tag or a maintainer on site, you know, you put in that admin code and you've got basically the same accessibility and functions and rights within uh, configuring the analyzer. Uh, the end series analyzers, they are trying to I think piggyback what Thermo is doing as far as having everything kind of daisy chain, which honestly, from an analyzer technician standpoint, that's kind of a nightmare because it makes it hard to troubleshoot. Because uh, if one component goes bad, it's going to affect everything. So, narrowing down what is wrong with it can be harder, but it also makes the, you know, the benefit to that is you can swap parts out quickly uh, instead of having a bunch of different size connectors and all these connectors inside of it, it's all one universal connector. So the hot swap ability for repairs is there to reduce the downtime, but to sit and actually troubleshoot, it kind of makes it a little bit harder. Um, but that's about what I got, I guess. So when it comes to 
in, in years past, most of the systems that we've sent out, customers would buy spare instruments because as, as technology increases, being able to troubleshoot and get an analyzer fixed on site for the technicians that are on in these plants, it, it, it really isn't easier. Do you think the technology would make that situation much easier than now? Uh, I, th I think it's a bigger, I think it's a bigger challenge. So having a spare in instrument as if it's a working spare, uh, you can put it in, in place and ship it to us and, and we can do the, you know, the repairs on it. If you have a complete analyzer, you have every part available to you to repair it at your, at your, at your site because a lot of times it's a possibility it might be one or two different components until you physically replace those individual components which you really don't know. Uh, we see that. We see that. So I would encourage people to have spare instruments. Yes, any questions for us? Ours is short and sweet. Not much. Sorry, we're going to be using this. Thank With you. The, the current Teledyne analyzers, I know we uh, did upgrades a couple years back one of our sites. Uh, one of the issues we noticed, if we have a power failure to the sim shock, the touch screens would become unresponsive when they come back. Um, and they basically just went defective. I was wondering if you all run into that before and if you'd had some suggestions or improvements for I, I can't say that we experienced that. Two or three years ago, in high humidity <clears throat> areas, we had some touch screens you know, totally fail uh -huh. that, had, that had to be replaced. We haven't had uh, probably in the last 12 months. We've been having the same issue with touch screens on the Teledyne. Um, they just went on responsive. Like, and uh, we have to end up using a mouse. But, right. Well, you asked me before that you can put the mouse in and do anything you can. Not yeah. too sure what would be causing that other than replacing the display. Yeah, we well, we kind of stopped just replacing and just. Because <laughs> so, um, you know, in, in some cases when the displays failed, even the mouse wasn't an option. You're, yeah, you're probably there was a, you're, you're you're a fortunate that that is a, a good package. Right. Um, so there's one from um, our online chat. It says that he works with you at their Empire Generating, and the question is, the DMOD boards and controlling CO drift. Okay, the Empire yes. Generation, they actually sent the, the Teledyne technician to that site. And one of the things that we found, or they found, was that um, CO analyzer in that particular circuit is temperature sensitive. So if you have your air conditioning set too cold, and if the analyzer sucks in and holds air, you'll get drift. Uh, on, the, on the CO detector failures, three or four years ago, they didn't have issues with the detectors failing in the manufacturing process. Uh, we still get an occasional one, but for the most part, they pretty well got that uh, the detector issue. I think that answers it. All right, thanks. But as someone that has the 951s right now, and I think have a budget to do an upgrade next year, we got some money that we are going to upgrade our analyzer. We are not going to it. Um, from Cisco's point of view, of course, I want to know what analyzer I, I want to go to. I want to know which one is going to be best for the long term. And you guys know all the pros and cons of these analyzers, but what are you recommend? Well, you have basically three options. I guess you have California Analytical. And we haven't sold a lot of those instruments, so having uh, spare parts available for those were pretty limited there. So basically, our two main instrument manufacturers are Thermal and, and 
because of the issues that they had with the IQ series, they're probably not my favorite at the moment. And so if you were asking for the current recommendation, probably the Teledyne would be my, my personal recommendation. All right. The I series analyzers that Thermo used, and basically what they're using in the IQ, uh, the individual detection components and all of that, they really, they really were an excellent analyzer. But when the uh, analyzer manufacturer comes out with a new model, there is a date that they no longer you know, sell the previous model. So we didn't have any choice. Now, and from what I've heard just in the previous presentation, that the, the Teledyne analyzers don't have that remote, remote control for the audio visual. Right, so it doesn't have a, a digital input to change it, the analyzer from the you NO know, or from NOx to the you NO know, X mode. Where the thermal, the I series analyzer that we have in the training shelter uh, does have that capability. I, I can't tell you whether the IQ does or not. The, 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 not, not that that's a requirement for us now, but of course, as things, who knows what the future holds, right? That could be something. So is that an option? So how that this whole situation with NO2 converters comes up is when the site does rata testing and the sims end up being lower on NOx reading, they automatically believe that it's a converter issue inside the NOx analyzer. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that's not. The, the good thing is that they have a cylinder of, of NO2 to test their, their equipment and they're required to do that. And you could, they're generally willing to let you take that cylinder and do a converter test, you know, if they're there for RATA, just to prove that that's true or not true. And a lot of times it ends up being a stratification or some other issue more so than it is the instrument. So on our probes, we have an auto port, and we'll have the test team hook up to that auto port and audit port, and in a lot of times, whatever the readings match. So you end up with all kinds of things there. But converters do have a wide, uh, depending on the concentration, they do deteriorate over time. But in, in the cylinder method at the, at the Lakewood facility that we that I personally deal with dealt with over the years a lot, uh, using the, the bottle method, the cylinder method, generally, you know, even if the cylinder was in good shape and you had a known good converter, you never got much over 90%. So on, on the device that Lynn has, has, has developed, we get more of the well, probably real world 95 plus in, in the tests that he's done uh, using that on. So the converters in the instruments are probably actually better than the testing that you results that you see from the instruments. It just has worked out. Well. Most of the time, they, because the instruments that we buy from from Teledyne, most of those have Molly converters, which are low lower temperature converters. So if we have to deal with a situation with high concentrations of CO that can get at high temperatures, can, it'll actually destroy the CO. Uh, we we using the, the lower temperature converters. The converters in the thermals are one hundred six hundred. C, and so we have to be careful on how we design the system dealing with the, with the CO, high concentration CO. And what about uh, dual element analyzers? Uh, on the dual, we're, we're all dual field units, so we have dual, um, or dual range analyzers. Right. That, uh, so in the analyzer that you have, the Rosemont, it has a single analog output. The VLC with a range relay, and 
going to the to the instrument itself it literally changes the analyzer's range. You can see it on the display change from the energized to high gas or the low gas. In newer instruments, they have dedicated analog output. So then the BLC, when you're during normal operation and you get to 90% of range one, then it starts looking at range two and as far as what which output that it's monitoring. So the, the analyzer never really changes ranges. It has two active ranges and analog output for both at the same at the same time. So whenever you do an upgrade, you have to have another input for the second channel or the second range. Most of the new instruments we have a analyzer fault output. So that also requires another input. In So either the thermal or the tapping, they they both have, they both have the analyzer all but, but so it, it gives a uh, in, indication in the control room that the analyzer has an issue. Um, it's it's a way of letting them know that they need to go check the instrument, even though their only requirement is for that analyzer to pass the data calibration. Okay. Just thinking out loud here, there's one more difference uh, slightly when it comes to the dual range analyzer between the tapping and the thermals. Uh, the thermals will go higher. 500. Uh, Devices the PPM on the range, on the high range of the NOx analyzer. Uh, the tapping has two different <coughs> analyzers. They have the tapping analyzer, well, they have three, but the M analyzer will go to 200 ppm, and then the H will go higher, up to that 500 range if you need it to. So there's a little bit of difference in the ranges. Most of our applications that uh, of the sites that we have, the 200 ppm is adequate as the max value, but it's just another consideration we have to have. Uh, but as Ray said, the, the decision on the new analyzers now is uh, more of personal preference. Thermals had a lot of firmware issues. Uh, and to address the issue on the end series analyzer, we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, and when I come up here with obsolete equipment and some other stuff that goes with it. But I'm not a shy person when it comes to talking to my vendors, and especially the analyzer vendors and the heated sample line vendors. Those are my favorites, uh, <laughs> both of them equally. Uh, the, uh, so we made a very big point to both Thermo and to Teledyne, and I'll continue to do so, that if we want something or need something or we're testing and we find fault, uh, we're the first ones to pick up the phone and let them know that they have a major problem. Uh, a few years ago, we were in St. Louis, so when the IQs came out, and I stood up in the Thermo meeting and told them, now do you want me to tell you the next 20 minutes what problems with your analyzer are? And so in front of 200 people, we let them know what uh, the analyzer shop had found out about all the problems with the thermal. The thermal made a big mistake they, when they first came out with the analyzer. Is no one cares about sentence, they only care about ambient emissions. So that analyzer was a great ambient, air, ambient uh, emissions or ambient air quality analyzer with great firmware for that. But we had to do daily calibration checks, and they said, well, an analyzer could never go negative, but how could that happen? It happens every day when you run a zero. What, what are you talking about? And they had no idea. So the analyzer were auto fault as soon as you, your, your uh, O2 uh, went to went negative. It was a mess. But they're gradually coming back and they're creating other problems too. Yeah. Uh, one other caution on replacing NOx analyzers. We had a site that went out and bought their own analyzers to replace 951Cs. And they found out that the analyzer wasn't capable of receiving an input from the PLC to change ranges. What was that? Uh, that was the uh, Exxon uh, down in Texas? Yeah, I don't remember. But well, what they were coming up with was their span gas for their low range was 
digging the analyzer automatically range up to the high range. They couldn't control it. They couldn't force it to stay in the low range while it was being spanned. So they had to end up buying span gas that was, say, 80% of the range rather than 90, because 90 plus and minus, if you have a, you know, a 95% of, of step change. So I forget what kind of brand analyzer they bought, but uh, they realized after the fact that you couldn't control the range on the analyzer. The analyzer was going to switch ranges when it saw a certain concentration, and of course during calibration, that's uh, it's kind of a failure. So be careful of that. <laughs> All right, we're going to take about 15 minutes uh, break, uh, and uh, I'll put my watch on timer so that I remember it. We'll come back in about 20 after 10. Uh, we'll come back. Thanks. <laughs>